Welcome again to the tutorials on dynamic system modeling and control. This particular tutorial focuses on building state-space models of RLC circuits. Once again, my name is Hossam Fathi, and uh, thank you for joining uh, me on this tutorial. Um, the goals of this particular tutorial are three. Number one, I want to develop a process for building state-space models for simple RLC circuits. Number two, I want to demonstrate the above process using RC, RL, and RLC circuit examples. And number three, I want to explore the frequency domain filtering properties of RLC circuits. Um, with these goals in mind, uh, I want to dive into the first goal, which is to develop a process for building state-space models of simple RLC circuits. Now, we've already developed a general process for building state-space models of general dynamic systems. And what I want to do is I want to recall that process and then I want to um, add a few details that make it specific to RLC circuits. So if you recall the state space modeling process, it begins by identifying the input and output variables for the system you're interested in. And then you identify the means of independent energy storage uh, in the system that you're interested in, assuming that it's an energetic system. And then um, based on this identification of independent energy storage devices, you identify the system state variables. And then finally, you use the laws of physics and the laws of continuity to write the state and output equations for these state variables and for the output variables. This is a generic process, and what I want to do is to um, basically add a few more details that make it specific to RLC circuits. So the first question is identification of input and output variables. In electric circuits, inputs and outputs are usually currents and voltages. Um, so you may have a source device, a supply device, that commands current or commands voltage, and then that would be an input variable. Or you may have a load or a sink device that absorbs a certain current or has a certain voltage across it, and, um, and uh, then that could potentially be a choice of output variables. The bottom line is this. In electric circuits, typically the input and output variables are um, source and sink currents or voltages. The next step is to identify the independent means of energy storage. Now, uh, the acronym RLC stands for resistors, inductors, and capacitors. Resistors, by their very nature, are dissipative and they do not store energy. Um, Inductors do store energy by creating an internal magnetic field, and capacitors do store energy by storing internally by storing charge. Um, so the fact that resistors are dissipative devices basically means that the energy storage devices are going to be inductors and capacitors. The word independent is important here. If you have two inductors that are connected to one another in series such that the same current flow, flows through them, these two inductors may be, uh, may be at different locations in space and therefore they may generate two separate magnetic fields and store two separate amounts of energy. But the fact that the same current flows through them essentially means that they're coupled devices that if you know how much energy is stored in one inductor, um, you know how much energy is stored by the other inductor. And so you need to identify energy storage devices that are independent. Because once you know the independent energy storage devices, then you can pick state variables. Now, as I've said before, the choice of state variables um, is not fixed. There is a large number of different choices of legitimate choices of state variables. However, conventionally, because an inductor stores energy by building a magnetic field related to the current flowing through the inductor, conventionally we use inductor current as a state variable. And because capacitors store energy by storing charge, one convention is to use state of charge or amount of charge in the capacitor as a state variable. I'm using the expression state of charge here a bit loosely. Let's say amount of charge in a capacitor is the state variable. Finally, you're going to use the laws of continuity and, and the laws of physics to write the system state and output equations. In an electric circuit, the most obvious laws to apply are Kirchhoff's voltage and current law, laws. These are basically the laws of continuity in an electric circuit. In addition to that, you're going to have to use the governing physical laws for the resistors, inductors, and capacitors in your circuit to finish writing the state and output equations. One example of that is Ohm's law, for instance, for a resistor. 
you're going to need to make use of that. So this is the state space modeling process specialized for RLC circuits. Now, um, with this process, we've completed the first goal, which is to develop a process for building state-based models of simple RLC circuits. The next thing I want to do is I want to apply this process. I want to demonstrate it using RC, RL, and RLC circuits. So let's dive into that. Let's dive into the problem of modeling an RC circuit. So here's a diagram of a simple RC circuit. It consists of a voltage source that supplies a dictated voltage, um, user dictated voltage, U as a function of time. There is a resistor R and a capacitor C. These could be linear or nonlinear. Um, I'm going to pretend that they're linear uh, for the sake of simplicity. And I want to develop a state space model of this circuit. The first thing, obviously, is to identify the input variable. And we've already selected U of T, the input voltage, as an input variable. Next, we want to identify the output variables. Those depend on what you're interested in when you're modeling this circuit. And we will see later in this tutorial that there is a really, really interesting um, observation that you can make when you realize that this circuit essentially takes input voltage and splits it into two voltages, a voltage drop across the resistor and a voltage drop across the capacitor. The question then becomes what fraction of the input voltage is split to be across the resistor and what fraction is across the capacitor. Um, that question depends, as we're going to see, on the frequency content of this input voltage U of T. And this will give us a lot of insight into how an RC circuit essentially behaves as a filter. For now, let me just say this. I want to understand how this input voltage U of T gets split across the resistor and capacitor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my two outputs, Y1, the voltage across the resistor, and Y2, the voltage across the capacitor. The next thing I need to do is to, uh, to identify state variables. Um, there's only one way that this circuit stores energy. The capacitor stores energy by storing charge. And therefore, I want my state variable to be X of T, the amount of charge in the capacitor. Before we proceed any further, I want to look at this circuit and I, you know, it's easy to remember, relatively easy to remember Ohm's law that the voltage across a resistor is current times resistance. But let me write down the governing law for a capacitor. The governing law for a linear capacitor is that its capacitance multiplied by the voltage across it is equal to the amount of charge stored in it. So capacitance multiplied by capacitor voltage C times V is equal to capacitor charge. So CV is equal to Q. Now we're ready to write down a state equation. If uh, our only state variable is the amount of charge in the capacitor, and if we want an equation for the rate of change of charge in the capacitor, the rate of change of charge is equal to current. Current is rate of change of charge with respect to time. The current flowing through the capacitor is the same as the current flowing through the resistor. And now we get to use um, Ohm's law, and we get to say that the current flowing through the resistor is the voltage across the resistor divided by the resistance. But the voltage across the resistor is the difference between input voltage and capacitor voltage. So we end up with a state equation that looks like this. X dot, rate of change of charge in the capacitor, is equal to current. The current is the current flowing through the resistor. The current flowing through the resistor is voltage across the resistor divided by resistance R. The voltage across the resistor is equal to the input voltage U minus the capacitor voltage. And as we can see from the capacitor law, the capacitor voltage is 1 over C, 1 over capacitance, multiplied by charge in the capacitor. The charge in the capacitor is our state variable X. So we end up with X dot is equal to 1 over R times u minus 1 over c times x. That's our state equation. Now we want our output equations. We want the voltage across the resistor and the voltage across the capacitor. The expression in square brackets in, in the state equation is actually the voltage across the resistor. Voltage across the resistor is input voltage u of t minus capacitor voltage. And capacitor voltage is 1 over capacitance, 1 over c, minus multiplied by capacitor charge. Now, the voltage across the capacitor itself is just 1 over capacitance multiplied by capacitor charge. 1 over C times Q, uh, or in the state space notation, 1 over C times X. Uh, 
We have built a state-based model of this RC circuit containing a governing law for the rate of change of the state variable, which is capacitor charge, and two output equations. We will come back and simulate the state-based model in Modelica. Um, before we do that, though, I want to go through two more examples. I want to go through an example of developing a state-space model of an RL circuit. And then finally, I want to go through an example of developing a state-space model for an RLC circuit. So for an RL circuit, I'm going to have an input voltage source, U of T, as before. I'm going to have a resistor uh, of resistance R and an inductor of inductance L. Um, I'm going to assume that these are both linear devices. Um, my input variable is still going to be input voltage and I still want to get the, the I still want to understand the way that this voltage is split between the resistor and the inductor so my two output variables are still the voltage across the resistor and the voltage across the inductor um, now I have a different energy storage device the only device in this circuit that can store energy is the inductor remember an inductor stores energy by building an internal magnetic field that um, that is related to the current flowing through the inductor so it makes sense for the state variable to be the current flowing through the inductor before I do anything else I want to write down the governing law for an inductor the governing law for an inductor is V across the inductor is equal to L di by dt inductance multiplied by rate of change of current with respect to time and you notice something really interesting here it's an equation that gives me di by dt, or rate of change of inductor current with respect to time. And that's exactly what I want for my state equation. I want a state equation for x dot, where x is the current through the inductor. So I want to get dx by dt, which is the same as di by dt. So I'm going to use this governing law for my state equation. x dot, my rate of change of inductor current, is 1 over inductance, 1 over L, multiplied by the voltage across the inductor. Well, what is the voltage across the inductor? It's equal to supply voltage minus the voltage drop across the resistor. The supply voltage is U of T. The voltage across the resistor is resistance multiplied by current, R times I. So X dot is 1 over L multiplied by U minus R, I. But I want this equation to be in state space form, so it needs to be R, X. That's basically the process here. My two output equations the voltage across the resistor is governed by Ohm's law voltage is resistance times current so Y1 is resistance R times current X and the voltage across the inductor is the difference between supply voltage and voltage drop across the resistor so Y2 is U minus R X so now I have built a state space model containing state and output equations for this RL circuit now let's kick it up a notch and develop a state space model of an RLC circuit. So an RLC circuit, the circuit that I'm interested in here, um, has a voltage source, U of T, and now there is a resistor and an inductor and a capacitor, all of them in series, attached to this voltage source, U of T. Now, first thing I need to pick again is the input and again I'm gonna declare that U of T is my input voltage is my only input to this circuit in the case of this particular circuit um, for simplicity I, I'm gonna just try to keep the the example simple and I'm gonna only have one output and I'm gonna say that that output is the current through the circuit as a as a an exercise for you as a piece of food for thought for you I want you to go back to this example after you watch this tutorial and draw the positive direction of this current through the circuit and draw the positive sign convention for voltage drops across the three components in this circuit I think that's valuable for you to learn how to um, basically create sign conventions when you're building state space models of RLC circuits so I have semi deliberately uh, neglected to draw a positive direction a positive arrow for current through the circuit in this diagram what I would like you to do to do is to go back and figure out what is the positive direction corresponding to the state equations I'm gonna create in just a second and the output equations before I create state and output equations I need state variables this time I have two energy storage devices a capacitor and an inductor 
Remember, the state variable corresponding to a capacitor is the charge in the capacitor. The state variable corresponding to an inductor is the amount of current flowing through the inductor. And remember the governing laws for capacitors and inductors. Capacitors times capacitor voltage equals amount of charge. Inductance multiplied by rate of change of current with respect to time gives you the voltage across the inductor. With this in mind, let's write down state equations. X1 dot, the rate of change of charge in the capacitor. Well, that equals the current flowing through the capacitor. And because all of these components are in series, that is the same as the current flowing through the inductor. So X1 dot is the same as X2. X2 dot, the rate of change of inductor current. Notice how I already have an equation on the slide for rate of change of inductor current. It's equal to 1 over the inductance, 1 over L, multiplied by the inductor voltage. The inductor voltage by Kirchhoff's voltage law is equal to the supply voltage U minus the voltage across the resistor minus the voltage across the capacitor. Voltage across the resistor is resistance R times current X2. Voltage across the capacitor is 1 over capacitance, 1 over C, multiplied by amount of charge, which is X1. So that completes my two state equations. Because current is already a state variable, the output equation is very simple. The output Y is equal to X2. So now I have a complete state space model for this RLC circuit. Now the next thing I want to do, now that I've built um, simple state space models of linear RC, RL, and RLC circuits. I, I just want to explore the frequency domain filtering properties of RLC circuits and, and more specifically I actually only want to explore in this tutorial the frequency domain filtering properties of an RC circuit. I, I am going to leave it up to you to build your own simulation code uh, and play with that simulation code to understand the filtering properties of RL circuits and RLC circuits, I'm just going to focus on RC. So I want you to recall the RC circuit model. The circuit model was that X dot is 1 over R times U minus 1 over C times X, that Y1 was U minus 1 over C times X, Y2 was 1 over C times X, where the variables are U of T is the input voltage, Y1 and Y2 are the voltages across the resistor and capacitor respectively, and X is the charge in the capacitor. Now what I've done here is I've built a very simple model in Medellica to simulate this RC circuit. So if we go to Medellica, I'm not going to type this model, I've already typed it in for you. Um, let's just go through the model. The name of the model is RC circuit and it has two parameters that pertain to the model and one parameter that pertains to its input. Um, I have a resistance R and a capacitance C, and I've set both of them to 1 for simplicity. Now, resistances of 1 ohm are not uncommon. Um, capacitances of, of 1 farad um, are somewhat odd when you're thinking about electronic circuits. They're, they're not unheard of. They do exist. Um, but if you go to... Um, an electronic store and you buy capacitors usually they have capacitances in the uh, micro nano and pico farads as opposed to uh, you know single digit farads but I'm just trying to keep this example very very simple I, I do not claim in in this code that these parameters correspond to a real physical device that I've built although they, they could you could modify the example and the parameters in the example to correspond to a real physical device um, we will get back to Omega in a second. Es essentially what I'm doing is I am creating an input excitation that is sinusoidal and Omega is the um, frequency of the sinusoidal excitation, um, the angular frequency of the sinusoidal excitation. I have a single state variable X and I'm just going to initialize it to zero for simplicity. I have two output variables Y1 and Y2. These are the resistor and capacitor voltages and my input U is the input voltage. Um, now, remember, as I said in a previous tutorial, Modelica does understand SI units, and the Modelica standard does define SI units. But here in this tutorial, as in the previous one, I am just making all of my parameters real and all of my state variables real without declaring their units, just to keep the example and the code simple. And I certainly encourage you to learn how to actually define uh, 
all of your quantities in Modelica using SI units. So my equations are that my input is a sinusoid. Um, I could have made it sine of omega t. I decided to make it cosine of omega t so that when I set omega to zero, cosine of zero is one. So I get a non-zero constant input. Um, and that's just a decision here that I want my input to be a sinusoidal wave and I want to be able to set it to a steady state value or to a, an actual time varying sinusoid by picking different values of omega. Uh, the state equation is that x dot is equal to 1 over r times u minus x over c. The output equations are y1 is u minus x over c and y2 is x over c. And those are the equations we just derived uh, just a second earlier in our, um, in our uh, slide presentation. So now what I want to do is I want to simulate this model in steady state. So I'm going to set my excitation frequency to zero. And I'm going, I'm going to simulate this model, let's say for 30 units of time, let's say time is in seconds, 30 seconds. I want to simulate this model and see what I get. Uh, the input U is constant. The output, y, and that is an input voltage, so I have an input voltage of 1 volt. The outputs Y1 and Y2 are both voltages, and they should both add up to 1 volt. We notice that there's some transients, but I'm not interested in those, and they die in a few seconds. In steady state, Y1 is 0, and Y2 is equal to the input voltage uh, U. But remember, Y1 was the voltage across the resistor, and Y2 was the voltage across the capacitor. What we're saying is that in steady state, the voltage across the capacitor is equal to input voltage. Now, why is that? Well, if the input voltage is constant, what happens is that you settle to a steady state where um, the capacitor essentially behaves as an open circuit. There's no current flowing, and therefore there's no voltage across the resistor. And as a result, all of your input voltage is across the capacitor. So this makes, this makes perfect sense, physical sense. And at very low excitation frequencies, the input voltage is predominantly across the capacitor. Even if we increase the excitation frequency a little bit, even if we go back and we make this excitation frequency, let's say 0 0.2 radians per second instead of 0 radians per second. And again, I'm going to simulate the model for, let's say, 20 or 30 seconds here. And I want to see what happens. What I'm going to get is an input voltage that is a very slowly varying sinusoid. The, um, the voltages across the resistor and capacitor change with time. They go through some transients. But in the end, you notice how the red and green lines are, are closely following each other, whereas the blue line is hugging zero, basically. And I think what's important here to recognize is that predominantly at low frequencies, the capacitor carries the input voltage. Now, what happens if I push to higher frequencies? What happens if I go back and I simulate this model for an omega of 10 radians per second, say? And because it's such a high frequency, 10 radians per second, I'm going to reduce my um, simulation time to 10 seconds here. And I want to see what happens. So, if I simulate this model, now my input voltage U is a sinusoid at 10 radians per second. And notice how it is now the blue output, Y1, the resistor voltage, that almost perfectly hugs the input voltage, and the capacitor voltage is almost zero. And the way to explain that is to realize that at very, very high frequencies, you may remember from your undergraduate physics class, capacitors begin to act as if they're, they're closed circuits. They begin to act, they begin to allow current to pass through with very, very little impedance. And this is something we will discuss in a lot more detail later in these tutorials. In that case, most of the voltage is indeed across the resistor. And the capacitor begins to behave as if it's non-existent. And that's what we're seeing here. So what we've constructed with this RC circuit is a filter, is a frequency domain filter. The filter is such that at low frequencies, most of the voltage is passed on to the capacitor and at high frequencies most of the voltage is passed on to the resistor so what's really interesting is if you treat capacitor voltage 
as your output signal, this circuit acts as a low pass filter. The low frequency voltages show up in your output. However, if you treat your output as resistor voltage, then this circuit acts as a high pass filter. The very fast frequency input voltages are the ones that show up across the resistor. This is really interesting because we're able to parse out with very simple components. We're able to parse out the low versus the high frequency components of the signal. So um, thank you very much. With this, we complete this tutorial. Thank you very much for uh, following through it.